May the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my Lord and Redeemer, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, please be seated. Well, today I wanted to uh, conclude uh, a discussion we had last week, but I wanted to take it a slightly different direction because I, let me rephrase this as being today about the warfare on faith. We talked about a little bit of it last week and the week before about putting on the full armor of God and what that really meant in the process. But you know, when a battle is fought, I don't know about you, it's like a football game, a baseball game, anything. We want to know who the winner is. The loser kind of goes by the wayside, but we want to know who's winning. If you ever ask anybody about a Florida, Florida State game, it's not who's the better game, who's winning? What's the score? We always want to know what the score might be. Well, I think most of us make the same mistake even when we think about our own Christianity. We think, for some reason, we've been taught the battle is already ours. Well, then we don't need all of that armor of God, do we? I mean, it's peaceful. There's nothing going to happen. There's no fiery darts of the devil that we have to worry about. The victory is already won, and that is true for your salvation. The crown already in our grasp. Now, the important thing is where we get confused, that we have to earn something or that we're given something. Well, in fact, we have to work at something. Earning is the wrong word. We tend to think that old things have passed away and that all things have become new and that our old corrupt nature, that Adam life we talk about in sermons, is gone. But all of us found out after serving Christ for a few months, if we have come to Anglicanism or to Christianity recently, for those of us that have been baptized since birth, we're kind of used to those fiery darts. They're just all around us. We get used to that after a while. But as we find out, if we've come to Christ later in life, the conversion was only like enlisting in the army. Right? That's just the enlistment part. There was, there's still a battle at hand. And that, if we were to get a crown, we had to fight for it. We had to defend it. We have to put on the armor of God. That's what that phraseology is all about. Salvation, it is true, is a gift. You don't have to earn salvation. It's as free as the air we breathe, and it always has been. To him that worketh not, though, but believeth, the phraseology in the New Testament. But on the other hand, if we we're to gain a crown, we must put some work into that. We are the Christian soldiers. We are in the image of Jesus Christ. We don't just sit around drinking tea going, it's over and we're the winner. I think there's a lot of people in Washington, D.C. that might disagree with that, particularly since one party just passed a resolution celebrating non-religious people and um, celebrating them as the force of the future of their particular party. Well, let me quote just a few phrases from 1 Corinthians. Quote, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But if any man buildeth on the foundation gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, stubble, each man's work shall be made manifest, if you build it on Jesus Christ. For the day shall declare it, because it is revealed in fire, and the fire itself shall prove each man's work. Of what sort it is? If a man's work shall abide, which he built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as through fire. We worry so much about the fact that, well, why is God, why do bad things happen to good people? Remember my old phrase? Why do any good things happen to any of us? Forget the bad things. We don't deserve any good things. We just pick out the bad things because, of course, we're like God. And we only deserve good things. That is not what the New Testament promised. It is like this. When a man or woman enters the army, they're a member of the army the moment you enlist, because they let you know that, don't they? For those of you who remember your induction into the military, I don't care which service it was, there's a guy called a DI, and he reminds you all during your training that you are now an enlisted person. And actually, you're not even a person anymore. You're scum, you're a worm, all of that sort of thing that you get used to while you're in there. He's just, that person is just a member. As a man or woman who has been in the Army, for example, 10 or 20 years, you're the same. The new guy, the guy that's been there 10 years, you are 
enlisted members of the army or navy or whatever. But enlisting is one thing, and participating in the battle is a wholly different thing. Young converts, if you will, and I've seen this, are just like those that just enlisted. They are flying in the clouds, and they should be. And then something happens and they fall headlong into the earth because they don't realize that that's not the battle. That's just the enlistment. It is silly for any man to attempt to fight on his own. That's why we have the church always talks about the ecclesia coming together in the ecclesia. That is the strength that we have. The world, the flesh, the devil are too much for you and for me alone. But if we are linked to Christ by faith, remember the armor of God. If we are linked to Christ by faith, the strongest emotion that has ever existed, because faith is defined by love, and love defines faith. Take a human example. When you get married, you love that person. And what do you have in that person? Faith. And that means what? Trust. It is very difficult for you and I to give up trust to somebody. We don't like that. Because if you give trust up to somebody else, you are vulnerable. You have to become fully vulnerable to Jesus Christ in faith, through love. The world, the flesh, and the devil are going to come after you. He has formed in us the hope of glory. And he tells us that, doesn't he, throughout the New Testament. Then we will go to the victory over the enemy. It is believers who are the overcomers. Quote, thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. It's just that simple. Through him, we shall be more than conquerors. Now, we, we're talking about conquerors. We're talking about standing in faith and ripping the souls away from the evil one to bring them back to Christ. That's the battle that we're in. By the way, he's not going to wait for you to do that. He's coming after you in everything you think and do and act and say. A good many Christian people make that mistake, I think. We kind of, oh, woe is me. Society is so terrible. It's always been terrible. You just haven't seen it. The underbelly sometimes hides itself until it's time. They think the battle is already fought and won. Well, your salvation is. The battle is not. They have an idea that all they must do is put their oars down in the bottom of the boat and the current will drift them into the ocean of God's eternal love. That only happens in Hollywood. Believe me. But we must cross the current. And the current does not want us to get to the other side. We must learn how to watch and fight and overcome. The battle, I must say to you, every day. You know, one of the things we, we, we get concerned of is we get tired. Human beings get tired. And we, like, we, we do like this little animal called a squirrel. Because every time we turn around and go, squirrel? And you're trying to do something, squirrel? Oh, I'll do this now. Oh, squirrel? Oh, but I forgot this over here. And pretty soon you've got five things sitting out there and you go, oh, I didn't do the first one yet. That's called squirrel. Because <laughs> what do squirrels do? It doesn't matter. And they always run in front of your car anyway, right? It's not just the advertisement. I think they're built that way. And so you run in front of the car and you get hit when you don't pay attention that that individual is aiming that vehicle at you. So the battle has just begun. The Christian faith life is a conflict and a warfare about faith, not, not human beating each other up, but about faith. And the quicker we find that out, the better we are. There is not a blessing in this world that God has not linked himself to. That's bad English, but anyway. All the great and higher blessings God associates with himself. When God and man work together, then it is that victory that is on the horizon. When God and man work against each other, destruction always follows. There's an old story. If you might remember, remember the individual Frederick Douglass way, way back when. The great slave speaker, a black man. Read his works. They're just erudite. They're beautiful. And once in a sad speech, when things look very dark for his race, this is what Frederick Douglass actually said. He said, quote, The white man is against us. Governments are against us. The spirit of the time is against us. 
I see no hope for our race. I am full of sadness. See what happens when you separate yourself from Christ in the victory? You become, you crash to earth. Just then, just then as the chronicle goes, an old African woman rose slowly, because she was quite old in the audience, and said, Frederick, is God dead? At that point, Frederick broke down and cried. Because he realized that he had separated himself from God. And this little old lady said, Frederick, have you forgotten who's in charge? Is God dead? Well, the fiercest attacks are made. Think about all those pictures that you and I like to watch. You know, the shields and swords and stuff. And it's movies and they're attacking. And You, you know, it's, it's, it's all this panoply of things going on. But what they say there is true. The fiercest attacks are always made on the strongest forts. The fiercest attacks are always made on the strongest forts. In the fiercer the battle, the young, young believer is called on to wage. And when I say young believer, I'm talking about us old Q-tips. You know, we, we have to worry about that as well. The sure evidence it is of the work of the Holy Spirit in his heart. The stronger the outside world attacks you, the more we know that your heart is with Christ. Just because you love Christ doesn't mean you're going to have an easy time. It's the reverse of that. Accept that. The world is not Christ's place. It is the devil's place. God will not desert you. He won't in this time of need any more than he deserted his people of old when they were hard pressed by their, by their enemies. This brings me to the fourth verse of the fourth chapter of the same epistle. Ye are of God, little children. And I've overcome them, because greater is he that is in you, in you than he that is in the world. Greater is Christ that is in you than the devil who is in the world. We tend to forget that. Oh, it's just so overwhelming. That's because you want it to be. You're giving up. You said, well, we're not going to win, so let's just go ahead and lose. I've always wondered if I got into a fight, let's say back in the Middle Ages, and I was getting tired. Would I just draw up my sword and say, okay, go ahead and kill me. I'm tired. That's pretty much what a Christian does when they, they drop their armor and they are disemboweled of their Christianity. The only man that ever conquered the world, the only man that ever conquered the world was Christ. So don't give it a try. It's not going to work. When he shouted on the cross, it is finished. It was the shout of a conqueror. It was the guy that won the battle. It wasn't the guy that lost. He had overcome every enemy. He had met sin and death. He had met every enemy that you and I will meet, because we're going to meet them too, and he won. Now, if I have the Spirit of Christ, and if I have the same life in me, then I have a power that is greater than any power in the world could ever be. I don't care what the attack is on you. Stand in faith. No one can hurt you. Can they take things away? Yes. Can they try to take your reputation away? Yes. Is that important? No. The only thing important is to stand with Christ because he will give you everything back and in multiples. But you have to stand and bear it with the armament that he's given you. Please notice that every human being in this world fails. I know some of us will go, oh, they're going to be really upset with me. Yet. Guess what? Ask. Children, ask your parents. Parents, ask your parents. You know, talk to your grandchildren, etc. We have a grandson that, um, I shouldn't say this, but he's never been taught to lose. And so it's, it's, it's a very interesting situation when granddaddy gets a hold of him. Uh, and, and we have to deal with loss and what that means. Because if a Christian never knows that, that they're going to lose, they in fact will be destroyed in the first attack. Every man, the moment he takes his eye off of God, has failed. Every man has been a failure at some period in his life. Abraham failed, and Moses failed, and Elijah failed. Oh, they didn't. They're the big guys, right? Abraham was noted for his faith, right? We're going to have as many Christians eventually as what meant in the Old Testament as, as the grains of sand in the desert. But he failed. He denied his wife. God did not like that. Moses was noted for his meekness and his humility. 
and he failed. He got angry. As you read the Old Testament. And what happened? God kept him out of the promised land. I know he was called the servant of God, and that he was a mighty man, and he had power with God, but humanly speaking, he failed and he paid the price. He could not go into the promised land. Elijah, if you, if you like him, because he was a, a man of prayer, Elijah was noted for his power in prayer and for his courage. I mean, here's a guy that goes into the king's court and says, eh, you guys aren't getting it. Things are going to be problematic here. You have to follow Yahweh. Yet he became a coward. He was the boldest man of his day. He stood before Ahab and the royal court and all the prophets of Baal. Yet when he heard that Jezebel had threatened his life, and you can read this in scripture, he ran away to the desert, went under the juniper tree and said, woe is me. Let me die. He had failed. Peter was noted for his boldness, actually for his mouth, but anyway, for his boldness. And a little maid scared him nearly out of his wits. A little 13-year-old, probably 12, 13-year-old girl. She was 14. She'd have been married. 12 to 13-year-old girl. As soon as he, she spoke to him, he began to tremble and he swore, I don't know Christ. Remember that? Christ, who's he? Hmm, no, I've never been with this guy. I mean, they're going to crucify this guy. I'd never be with him. I've often said to myself that I'd like to have been there on that day in the Pentecost, alongside of that maid when she saw Peter preaching. This is my thought. Why? I suppose she said. What has come over that man? He was afraid of me only a few weeks ago, and now he stands up before all Jerusalem and, change, and charges that the very Jews with the murder of Jesus. The moment he got his eye off his master, he failed, and every man, I don't care who he is, even the strongest, Every man that has in Christ in him, in my opinion, including me, is a failure. John, the beloved disciple, John, was noted for his meekness. And yet we hear of him wanting to call fire down from heaven on a little town because it had refused common hospitality. John paid for that as well. Now, how are we to get the victory over all our enemies? Galatians, second chapter, verse 20. Quote, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith. Here we go again. The faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We live by faith. Faith defined by love. Love defined by faith. We get this life by faith and become linked to Emmanuel, which we will get to soon, God with us. If I have God for me, I'm going to overcome. How do we gain this mighty power? It's not hard. You don't have to go through seminary. It's by faith. It is by faith. But then let's look at Romans chapter 11, verse 20. Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. The Jews were cut off on account of their unbelief and were grafted in on account of our belief. So notice, we live by faith and we stand by faith. We want a Christianity that goes into our homes and everyday lives. Some men's religion put on a whining voice in sort of this religious tone. You've seen them. They're on television, some of them. And talk so sanctimoniously on Sunday that you would think that they were wonderful saints themselves. Oh my gosh, he's on TV, and besides, he's in a white suit. He's got to be a good guy, and there's a light shining down on him. And boy, that radiates all kinds of goodness. And if you remember far back enough, one of them actually was found in his birthday suit dancing on top of a chest of drawers with a couple of ladies in his room on Monday. Beware. Have true faith. That determines your actions. You cannot be a saint on Sunday and an evil one on Monday and expect to come back on Sunday and Christ be with you. We must have a higher type of Christianity or the church is gone. It's gone. It is wrong for a man or woman to profess what they don't possess. If you are not overcoming temptations, simply put, the world is overcoming you. How do you overcome temptations? Simple, my friends. Faith in Jesus 
Christ. If you stand in faith, let all the fiery darts come at you. You will be saved. You will be returned to what you were. You will be with Jesus Christ in the end. Stand in faith. It's not that difficult. You know the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost.